work on uh, many different things, uh, load balancing being one of them. Maybe it's just French people uh, like to work on load balancing. I really appreciated uh, Damien's presentation beforehand. He introduced some concepts that I'll get to skip over. I have a really long, whoa, there it is again. Uh, really long title up there. So I wanted to shrink that down a little bit by pointing out the, uh, I've been having troubles with this. There we go. Those are the pieces we're really going to talk about. IPv6, segment routing, MVPP, and how together they can make a better pointer. There we go. <laughs> how together you can assemble these pieces and do some interesting things with load balancing. Uh, so first, IPv6, and since we're at a, a Kubernetes or a KubeCon conference, um, a little bit on the status of IPv6. This is a uh, work being done by my colleagues, Dane LeBlanc, uh, Rob Potier, and uh, Paul Michali, uh, Michali. You can speak to them for uh, details on exactly what we're doing in uh, Kubernetes. But the main point being, we're sort of at the crawling and walking phase right now, where you kind of look at v4 and v6 and say, okay, search and replace. Okay, wherever there's v4, we're going to make v6 and see if everything continues to work with the idea of eventually moving up to preparing and planning for some of the things that I'm going to be talking about today, that when you have v6, um, what you can do. So where are we with v6 in the internet? That was Kubernetes. Of course, v6 has been around for a long, long time, uh, but recently it's been uh, taking off quite a bit. Um, the top chart, this is going to be problematic. I'm just going to have to sit over here. I used to usually like to walk around, but I'm going to have to try to stay planted here. The blue line is as measured by Google and reported on their website. There's the link there, there at the bottom. And my colleague, Eric Vinke, he scrapes their site every day and, record, and stores it and then publishes these charts. So Belgium is at 50% of IPv6 as seen by Google. So every time you Google or YouTube or whatever, they geolocate to Belgium and they publish these um, up to each country and they publish these results. Now that's without any mobile uh, activity from the ISPs. The ISPs haven't moved v6 to v6 in the mobile network yet. So 50% just from enterprise and landline. Um, Germany and USA, pretty straight lines up and to the right. Uh, around the 35% range. Now, it's not just big economies, it's, it's our smaller ones as well. Greece there uh, started a bit later, but ramped up uh, quickly to catch up with uh, Germany and the USA at around the 30 to 40% range. Um, this is the uh, tortoise and hare argument here. France was a, back when I started working on IPv6, uh, in 2011, 2012, when we did the world launch, France was the leading country in the entire world with IPv6, with this, you know, around 5 or 6%, mostly from the ISP Free Telecom. Uh, and that stayed that way until Orange kicked in, but then India came online. Boom, Reliance Geo uh, uh, deploys 183 million endpoints within uh, two years on IPv6. And... Don't want to throw the country under the bus that's hosting us here, but uh, I would, you know, we keep st stats on everything. Denmark is 3.5%, so not all the countries are like this. Globally, we're around uh, one in four users have IPv6. Now, just to get across, and I think it's important for an audience that's going to be thinking about using IPv6 and putting it into Kubernetes, is, you know, w how different v4 and v6 is and that's just it's not just the, the how the protocols uh, operate and everything but how it's being used and how it's being deployed and this is a really interesting data point uh from my friend over at uh, akamai so this is from their infrastructure looking at unique ipv6 addresses that they see in a given period of time here it's in one week and they see almost 10 billion unique ipv6 addresses within a week now, that's, of course, far less than they see unique IPv4 addresses because there's only 4 billion IPv4 addresses in the world. Um, they even see more unique slash 64s than they see IPv4 addresses. So what this suggests to me is there's a, a lot of churn in terms of the IPv6 addresses. They're doing more than just being a, a single address on the side of a NAT or a single address to, to an endpoint. 
uh, they're changing quite a bit, and there's, there's reasons for that. But the infrastructure supports it. Speaking of infrastructure that supports V6, uh, at Facebook, this, has been go this is a presentation from Facebook uh, last December. They've gone 100% V6 only within their infrastructure, and they effectively uh, support at the edge a proxy between V4 and V6 for the internet users. But everything internally is V6 only. And yes, it's with containers, it's not with Kubernetes. Uh, and they do some unique things. As I showed with Akamai, with all these different V6 addresses that aren't just you know, one endpoint out there, there's more than that, they're addressing each container, each task with a unique IPv6 address. And you always have to think about it as over time, right? Like, how many addresses am I using over time? Because they can be ephemeral. You can use them and not use it again for a number of years if you'd like. I collectively call this routing past the interface. And each of these little pictures uh, correlates to either a project that I know of that's happening or one that I, we're running in our uh, research lab in Paris, that when you have all this extra room, when you move, take something that was 4 billion and you increase it by 30 orders of magnitude, the, the way the network operates can be different. I talked about reliance. 183 million subscribers, they're only getting v6 addresses because this was an ISP that came into existence after the IPv4 runout. So they, your mobile phone only gets a v6 address. That's really not an incredibly new thing when you consider in T-Mobile in the US has been that way for several years. And there's different types of transition technologies and people kind of get scared because there's so many of them. But really it started to narrow down to a couple of different ones with funny different acronyms. But the bottom line is, is this idea that I can take part of my network or part of my deployment or whatever it is and V6 only it, and then put V4 out at the edge. Now because V6 has all this address space, we can, again, we can start using it for things other than routing to a single interface. I can take my port space in V4 and a bit of my uh, V4 address space and shove it into the V6 address space with an algorithm that allows a stateless translation between the two. And then I can encapsulate or I can translate, and together we call this thing map. Mapping address and port, uh, mapping address and port, map. Uh, routing IPv4 addresses and ports in the v6 infrastructure. So you have this v6 infrastructure, it's there if you've set it up. By putting the ports and the v4 addresses inside the addresses, v6 addresses in a certain way, you get the power of routing to get the packets where they need to go without having to set up stateful NATs. So that's v6 in two minutes. Segment routing. Everybody knows what a tunnel is, right? Have I missed any of the acronyms for tunnels up here? <laughs> is there, surely there's one. Your favorite tunnel. You probably invented a tunnel in your lifetime. It, I almost put it on there, but I've been in a long architectural debate with Joe Touch on whether or not MPLS is actually a tunnel or not. What's that? What? L3 VPNs. Well, they tend to use MPLS, but may use other stuff. Anyway, lots of them out there. And I think the proliferation of tunnels happens because they're typically pairwise. Sometimes they're a group around an edge. But if this start of the tunnel is the same protocol as the end of the tunnel, it works. Because that's the whole idea is that all the stuff in the middle doesn't have to know about it. A tunnel has a, has a start and an end, uh, just like the tunnel there on the screen. Segment routing is a bit like a tunnel in that it's got a start and an end, but it's got multiple ends, okay? So rather than just going in and then out, you can, it's sort of like stitching tunnels together, if you will, but in a way that's, that's, that's designed from the start to be able to do that. So this lets you, from the source of the packet or the start of the tunnel, send a packet to multiple waypoints just like you see up here. Now those waypoints, if they're in V6, and you've got all this address space, 
they don't have to be individual nodes. They can be services inside the router or inside a, a compute node or what have you. Because with 128 bits, you can, I, just like I was identifying, hey, this, is, this address actually contains a bit of a v4 address and a bit of a port, I can say this address means perform this function on the packet. Install this state. Get rid of the state. And you're going to see why that's important when Pierre gets up here. Sorry about that. So we're going to talk about three things. So that's IPv6, segment routing. Just think of segment routing as a tunnel, but one that you can go through multiple waypoints and do stuff. Uh, VPP is a... I can go to the next slide for that. I hate not having my little slide thing. VPP is a project. Um, actually, anything about VPP, you can ask Heather Kirksey right there. Um, it's the FD.io project, or the Fast Data project in the Linux Foundation, or FIDO, as it's sometimes called. Uh, it's a vector packet processor, which is a very uh, fast packet processing engine. So as you see here, it'll run on bare metal, it'll run on VM, it'll run containers, what have you. It's, a, it's just the packet processing engine, and it runs in user space. So it bypasses the kernel, and you get to do all sorts of fancy stuff inside the, uh, the VPP system. And it lets you, you know, move at a different pace than waiting for the, the kernel in terms of uh, network features. Also, it's running in user space on the compute nodes, and there's convenient ways to share memory with other applications on uh, the compute node, and that's a core of what we're going to be getting into in just a moment for the SRV6LB application. So if you have VPP, which is the fast data project in the Linux Foundation, you have, how do I get it into containers? Well, one way to get it into containers is to use Contiv, uh, which is uh, CNI, et cetera. You can kind of see it on the, on the chart here. This is the canonical chart about VPP in Kubernetes. So Contiv VPP puts uh, VPP into Kubernetes. And finally, I stole this literally from my, um, uh, from Lou Tucker, who did a CTO for us this morning. I said, hey, that shows Contiv inside this whole big package. So you can go over to the booth and find some Contiv guys, and they should be able to tell you how Contiv gets uh, VPP into uh, Kubernetes, at least in that platform. Um, now, finally, SRV6LB. You just got a tutorial on load balancing, and that's fantastic. Um, L4 load balancing, as you just heard, you do some sort of you know, random round robin, hash, consistent hash, what have you, uh, and then you tunnel or not, maybe a GRE tunnel, whatever, to get to uh, the chosen server destination. Okay? Um, this is without monitoring. If you do monitoring of the app, it, I argue it's a, it's, it's a different thing because the, this green box has to do a lot more if it's trying to constantly um, monitor the, the given load of any server and make an intelligent decision based on that. And we want to think of a, 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 another way of doing this. We base this on Google's Maglev. Maglev has a very clever way of doing its consistent hashing. Um, and it's self-described as embarrassingly uh, distributed. So here's really the, the key. Um, instead of selecting one, uh, des possible destination with my consistent hash, I'm going to select two up front. And it's a bit like the power of two choices. Well, we definitely use the power of two choices. It's a bit like the, um, the bounded load stuff. But instead of uh, relying on the endpoints to, to chain the packet along the way, we let the load balancer, who's got a view of, of all, the, all the possibilities, select two. And because I have the segment routing, which is like a tunnel, with multiple hops. I can just say, go to here, and then go to there. And at each hop, I can make a decision. What's the current load level of the application, the VIP, that I'm targeting on that compute node? If it's below a threshold, I accept it. If it's above a threshold, I pass to the next. And this is all done at the network layer. The applications don't see it, other than the network layer in, in the compute node being able to see the current metric that the application wants to balance on. And what's interesting is the load balancer doesn't have to be aware of that metric at all. It could be CPU percentage, it could be a queue depth, it could be number of threads, it could be 
how much memory you have. It's whatever the application wants to balance upon because the decision's being made locally by that application on the compute node, and it's just a yes, no. If it's no, he doesn't even have to think about where to send it next. It's already in the packet because SR is like a multi-hop tunnel. Now, when we first thought of this, and the way it's, it's architected is we can go through multiple, but we found the same thing that Damien did. Two is the magic number. You get to, if you choose two packets, there we go, I mean two destinations, you get a significant benefit. Three, you get a little bit more of a, bene a little bit of benefit, two, one, all the way up to N, and it, it decreases as you go along the way, all the way up to the end. Here's a couple of results. I'm not going to spend too much time on it because Pierre's got a live demo, assuming the uh, demo gods don't uh, uh, come down upon us. But you can see here, these are graphs of the CPU loads, and we've set a threshold. And on the maglev side, nothing wrong with maglev, wonderful technology, don't want to call anybody's uh, you know, invention ugly or anything. But this is taking that and just improving on it. These are unlucky requests, so when you're really running hot, every once in a while, you're going to get unlucky. And the hotter you run, the more unlucky you're going to get. And since the load balancer has no knowledge of the load of the system, it can happen, right? And so in our test bed, we were able to you know, land on a lot of unlucky um, uh, requests there. Same setup, you turn on the SRLB, and the, naturally, the, you, you move on to the next server. And you can see that sometimes you get unlucky twice. That's when, oh, I tried this one, I was above the threshold, I tried the next one, oh well, and he accepts it anyway, because that threshold's not 100%, it's something less. So it does happen, but you end up with something that's much, much more fair. In terms of, there's two ways to look at the benefit here. You can say, all right, same infrastructure, same load pattern, what's the client page load response time, so the experience of the client. Another way to look at it is, can I reduce the amount of infrastructure for the same SLA? So this is the, the, the first way where I can say, for a given set of servers, here's the page load time. Maglev is better than, like, uh, round robin. It's doing, it's doing a good job here. Uh, but SRLB does a better job. And you can see, as we get um, up to 80 and 90%, the, it's two and a half times better in terms of page load time. Pierre's demo shows all this, but in better detail. This is just that reverse situation. For a given SLA, I can move 20 to 25% less servers and get the same response time out of the client. So with that, I'm going to hand straight over to Pierre. We're going to have to change machines here. If you want to know any of the excruciating details, there's a whole academic side of this. Johan did it. He's somewhere in the audience. There he is. This is part of his PhD. There's all the math behind it, uh, as well as the details of the experimental results. Um, that was just published in IEEE ACM Transactions on Networking. And I hand it over to Pierre. Thank you. And I'll, yeah. Mm. Hello, everyone. So I'm going to show you a demo, but before that, I will explain you, give you a, some details about the implementation that we did in VPP. So I need to find my slide. It's this one. And I will just give up on the pointer or maybe try it might work or not. OK, so as you all know now, VPP is a virtual router and virtual switch. And it's very, very efficient. It's a code that is beautifully optimized. One of the reasons why it's so efficient is by design. All the packets go through a set of uh, nodes. So they are traverse a graph. And each node does a very, very simple operation on, the, on each packet. So here you see an example going from DPDK. You see the IP lookup. You see the transmission on the wire back. So this simple IP forwarding. And this is very extensible as well. As well. So that doesn't work. I would have to press the button. Um, so in our case, we uh, implemented the load balancer on one side and the server agent on the other side as two different uh, VPP plugins. Uh, for instance, when you receive a packet on the load balancer, well, this is just a different node in the graph, and the packets are forwarded by the IP lookup, so we, uh, this is extensible, right? You can 
ask VPP to send you as a plugin some specific packets uh, to your uh, own custom nodes. Same thing when the server agent on the server side receives the packet, it's sent to one of our nodes, and then based on the destination IP that is used based on S the segment routing, uh, we can dispatch the packet to the different nodes that we have inside our plugin. Uh, same thing on the, um, on the other direction, when you receive a packet from the application uh, on the server agent side, uh, we leverage another way that VPP is able to hand off uh, packets to uh, the plugins that are called IP features. I'm not going into too much details here, but the idea is that it's very flexible. Now, uh, let's focus on a small piece of it, which is actually the key idea of uh, segment routing load balancer, is uh, this idea of having a choice. Uh, here the packet, uh, on the server agent is received, and it's a packet for a new connection. That's why it's called connect if available. And it's only if there, is, there are resources available that the connection is going to be accepted. And because that decision has to be taken on a per flow basis, every time there is a new flow, well, it has to be fairly efficient. And that is... Uh, as well extensible. That in our plugin, we implemented a set of different policies. One, and the one that we're showing in, our, in the demo, is based on Apache, because Apache um, provides an API where you have a shared memory. Uh, you can establish a shared memory, memory where you will see live the, um, the busyness of the, um, of the Apache server. Uh, we also implemented uh, uh, something with Nginx. Uh, we also have a standard way to do it with Linux C group. So if you don't have a custom application, you can use something that is a bit more generic. And that's completely extensible. You can have other plugins that are application specific. I if you have an application yours and you want to um, give to VPP uh, a vision of what is your current load, and the application is the better is the best place to know what's the current load, based on the metric that matters for the application. You can make a VPP plugin and provide this uh, visibility to the server agent, such that when a connection is received, the server gets to decide whether to accept the new connection or forward it to the next um, choice, the next um, server to accept the connection. Um, then one of the aspects I would like to mention as well is the, um, the nice things about using IPv6 segment routing is that actually you have plenty of bits in the address. 120 bits, that's a lot. And you can use that to optimize um, well, your, your code, basically. So even though it's pro protocol thing, in the destination IP address, you have all those bits. Some of the bits that we use are here for the function. Uh, so those are the bits that are, that, are, that are going to tell this packet is a new packet, or uh, I mean a new flow packet, or a flow that already exists. And you're going to do something uh, based on that function. That's really used to optimize the code path inside VPP, but I mean it can be used in other implementations as well. And then we still have 40 bits left. We call them the opaque number because that's something that is picked by the load balancer or the server agent. And on a per flow basis, it's sent to the other side. And the other side is just going to echo the, the, that opaque number back every time there is a packet going in the other direction. Uh, we use that for two purposes. One is CPU steering, and the other one is the, 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 to optimize the flow lookup in our flow table. So the details about the CPU steering, um, which is very problematic when you implement something at very high uh, rates, is that so the, you, you receive a packet for a flow, uh, the NIC receives the packet, and the NIC is going to hand off that packet to a given CPU. Uh, you don't control that. It's not yours to pick. It's the NIC that does that. It's called RSS. And so on that CPU, on that core, that's where you're going to install the, the, the state. And because you want to uh, avoid using locks uh, between the different cores, be because you're just going to destroy your performance if you do, uh, you need to do lockless data structure. So you, you can only install your state on one single core. And so that's where the trick happens. When you send the packet to the server agent, you put the CPU index. And so when the packet comes back, you have no way of making sure that the NIC is going to send it to the right core. Most of the time, it's going to be the wrong one. So the way you do it, in, if you don't have that label, well, it's, uh, you compute the five tuple, you decide what core you want to send it, and then you send it to the core. 
that's a bit expensive. Here, you get the bits right inside the packet, and you can send it to the right core, and, and then continue. Uh, finally, one word about uh, the performances, because we have eval evaluated, we have compared uh, this new approach to load balancing SRV6LB with maglev. Both are implemented in VPP, and both are really well optimized. Uh, SRV6LB adds a little bit of overhead. Uh, you see we go from 8.3 million packets per second per core to uh, 8 million packets per second per core. Uh, I understand you're maybe probably not all networking people, uh, but basically that means that if with one core you can roughly um, load balance about 22 gigabytes uh, per second of traffic. Uh, there is a trick here in that number. It's not like all the traffic goes through the load balancer. Here, the load balancer, because it's a layer three, layer seven, and uh, no, sorry, layer three, layer four, and not a proxy, it only sees the packets that are going in one direction. Okay, so that's one thing that you can do with this kind of load balancer that you can't with um, application level load balancers. Um, and one thing as well is that SR uh, V6LB is more scalable. It can scale to uh, 1 million flows and more because we have a custom flow table that is now open sourced uh, in VPP. So, demo time. Right. Should be working. Great, it's not. Okay. Forgive me. I will just restart my small setup. Okay, now we should, we should start again. So this demo is um, monitoring and controlling live a setup with one load balancer and uh, up to 16 different servers. Uh, those are Nginx servers. They are basically computing uh, pi decimals. That's why you see the little pies on the screen. Um, this is obviously pretty small, but it's kind of, it, it could scale up way much more than just 16 servers, and it could scale up to more load balancers, uh, but it's enough to, to prove the point that I want to make here. So let me check the parameters that I have. I will just first switch to maglev and put my 16 servers here. So. Does that work? Yeah. So here, um, so you see the load balancer, you see the different servers that are here. Uh, and now, if you have a look at this graph here, uh, you have what uh, Damien explained earlier and uh, what Mark mentioned as well, is that with a simple consistent hashing algorithm, you are go uh, your requests are going to each servers that are fairly loaded. That's, uh, that's a problem you have with consistent hashing, uh, and that's why you have consistent hashing with bounded load. Now, our approach also is uh, plan, uh, I mean, also solves that. And here you see the requests that are eating servers that are fairly loaded. This here is the load um, of the servers. It's a bit messy. It's like the, the, the one, the graph that Mark showed before, but it's going to be clearer uh, at the next step. Have a look as well at the, the response time. I mean, that's what people care about. It's the response time that you get by using a given type of load balancer. So here, I'm just going to set a threshold, which is the a threshold uh, load uh, at which the, 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 the agents, the server agents, are going to reject the connection. So for now, nothing happens. We are still using maglev. I'm switching to SRLB, second routing load balancer here. And you will see immediately all the servers that are rec uh, receiving requests um, that are loaded more, that have more than four different outstanding requests at a time, are now going to send the connection to the next uh, choice, the, te the next server. Sometime, as Mark mentioned, you get uh, unlucky twice. But most of the time you don't. And here you see the difference. You have almost no servers that are delivering re requests and that are more loaded than four um, outstanding connections at a time. So you get the benefits uh, that you would get by using a load balancer that would know exactly the load of all the servers. That that's the kind of thing you could get with a layer 7 load balancer or a lo lo uh, load balancer that pulls the state of the, um, 
of the servers at the same time. But here, you do it in a distributed way, and the decisions are made instantaneously. So like when a server gets a request, it doesn't make the decision of accepting, or of accepting the connection based on some information that it got like two or five seconds ago or 10 seconds ago, depending on how good is your um, message forwarding mechanism that get, lets you retrieve your load of the servers. Here it's instantaneous and it's specific to the application. Um, no, so that's, that's one aspect. You see the, the performance improvement here. Uh, well, that's a spike that we get sometime. Um, here we went from three, between three and 400 milliseconds for the 19th percentile to uh, less, than, less than 200, so 180 milliseconds for, um, for the 19th percentile. The median doesn't change that much because we are not really improving the servers. The servers are the same. But we are better utilizing the, um, the CPU of the servers. We are more fair in our distribution. One thing you can do from there is reduce the number of servers. So if I uh, switch from 16 servers to 12 servers, that's a 25% reduction in the number of servers. Here I switch to maglev again. And well, it's not good. It's not good because we don't. Uh, with maglev or any kind of consistent hashing algorithm, you need to kind of over-provision the number of servers that you have, otherwise uh, you explode and uh, the response time is, is really bad. But with SRLB, again, since we are more fair, um, you are able, with 12 servers, to uh, have the, basically the same response time than what you, we were having before. Well, it, it's now gone. Um, I'm going to show it again. I will put 16 servers with maglev just to, to show that you get the same, the same thing. So here it's maglev with 16 servers. Right before it was SRLB with just 12 servers. And uh, the SLA, the response time, is, is approximately the same. And actually it's slightly better for SRLB in that case. So, um, that's all for the demo. Uh, I think Mark and I can answer a few questions or I can also, if you want, press buttons and, and show you that it's live and show you what's going on. VPP code running on the server that is receiving these connections, or does, does it just reject the connection? So you need something that would forward the connection when it's too loaded. It doesn't need to be VPP. It could be a different implementation, but right now our implementation is based on VPP. You would need to support segment routing with some ability to do that application check, right? Yeah. And uh, the, the, the idea behind do, using segment routing is that we have it in VPP. You know, it'll eventually be uh, be present in the in the networking stacks. But uh, VPP makes it very convenient, and uh, Pierre could show off uh, how how fast and awesome it is. <laughs> yeah, if you want to know more, by the way, we have a. Um <laughs> we have a booth, uh, at the Cisco booth we are showing this demo, so if you want to know more about it. And there also is a FDIO booth uh, where you can learn more about VPP. So you're getting the information about the load in, in your fast path, right? Yep. Isn't that dangerous because you're at the mercy of the application that gives you the information? That's why we use shared memory. Oh, so this is like the only option. No, you have other options. Actually, the, the one that we show is a Linux uh, C group. For now, this one is synchronous and is using a, a call to, to Linux. But it's the only option if you want to make it very efficient, is to use shared memory. In the, in the case, maybe it was the same with Nginx, but certainly with Apache when we did the tests. This is a, it's, a, it's an API call that exists in Apache. Mm. Today, we didn't have to modify it or anything. We're just using this API that's specifically for load monitoring. It's just we're doing it in the data path. But I guess that when they added this API in Apache, they were thinking some external 
to the monitoring system, not, not to the It's a brand new world. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, thanks for the great talk. Um, I was wondering, uh, you mentioned that the label in the, well, in the last uh, 64 bits um, can help you find the right CPU back on the reverse path. Yep. Why does it matter? Why, why is, it, is it better to uh, redirect from the, well, the CPU, the packet ends up to the right CPU and yep. then through the NIC? So, so that's a very good question. It's um, because if you don't do that, uh, if you want two different cores to operate on the same flow, then your flow table has to use a lock. You, you need locking between the two. So it's actually much more efficient to pay the price of handoff between the cores, sending uh, the packet from to the right core. It's going to make, you, make your implementation much more efficient because you don't need to synchronize the different cores when they touch the flow table. And you can also, um, I think, scale better in terms of uh, the sticky table, the table that you have to, to keep, right? Yeah, the, you, the number of flows, yes. Yeah, the number of flows. So if, for example, these were separate line cards in a system or something like that, separate MPUs with their own memory, each could use its own flow table memory separately rather than having to use some shared memory um, and scale horizontally like that, if you deterministically know, you can always get to the, the right line card or NPU or what have you. Because it's just a routing decision to get to the right one because of that CPU index. It's part of the address, so I could literally route to the right part of the distributed system hmm. and, uh, and have just the table there that I need. Right? Yeah. Okay. So if a server is starting to get loaded and it's forwarding more and more connections or more and more flows to its sort of second one in the chain and then goes down, does that also break all flows to the second server? Right. So the, um, that was mentioned by Mark. It's, uh, well, it's based on this result, the power of two choices. Uh, again, if you, get, you, you can get unlucky once. That's what we used to say. You can get unlucky once. You have a certain probability of hitting a server that is really loaded. Uh, when that happens, you forward. The probability that you get unlucky twice is, you know, exponentially decreasing. And oh, so the question I have is, if, this, if the first server in the chain then goes down, does that interrupt flows that, are, that were being forwarded to the second server in the chain? So no. you're, you're supposed to detect that and the Wait, load balancer... What? I think the answer is simply no, unless we're in recovery mode, but it's a detail. Mm -hmm. No, the load... So, load balancer, I try this server, bounce to the next oh, server, yeah, yeah, I yeah. install state for that server for the life of that flow, okay, the right. second one. If the first one goes down, I'm still routing packets just to the first one for the life of that flow. I mean, to the second one. Yeah, that, that's an important, flow. I didn't mention that. The, yeah. the, the, the fact that we go through two servers only happens on the scene packet. Or the, the, the very first the beginning packet of, of the, the connection. Yeah. And then it's direct. Yeah, yeah sorry. So, and the router, the, the, or the, the, sorry, the load balancer, I say router because I guess I work at Cisco, um, but the, the load balancer that's directing it the right way is, it, uh, you know, is unaware of the start of the flow per se. That's up to the application to, to, to tell it that it's the beginning of the flow. That's what some of these bits that we use. And it's like installing a, it's like installing a host route, if you will, um, dynamically and then removing it at the beginning and end of the flow, okay? So once it's sticky and pointing to the right place, the other server can go down. Anything else? I guess there's a keynote coming yep. up. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pierre. That was great.